So good, e <laughs> good evening after that slight interruption from Zoom. So I'm gonna crack on with the presentation. There's a huge amount to cover. So let me apologize in advance. I am gonna to have to go at absolutely even more lightning speed than usual. Um, do have a look at the presentation if you can offline and um, the presentation material as well, because I won't necessarily be able to talk about everything that's actually on the slide. So normal five topics, I'll go through each of them in turn. So let, looking at chapter 10, we are now, we've done Galilee, we've been through that, and we are actually at the end of this sec second, rather brief, on the way section, um, which we've been kind of through for the last couple of weeks. So we've had fairly regular reminders that Jesus is on the way, as we're calling this section. Um, and really, as many of you have pointed out, we're really focusing uh, on the demands of discipleship, what to do, what not to do. Um, and we're particularly talking about service, which is obviously something that Kim and others brought up. Um, faith is a big topic here, uh, and that reliance on God's grace, which I think is the particular lesson of the children, I think, in this, in this particular case. Um, I think also we've got a series of things about earthly relationships and also earthly ties. We've obviously got the difficult subject of marriage and divorce, of children, which we talked about, of status, uh, James and John particularly, um, and of riches. All of these things are things that, if you like, bind us to earthly matters if, rather than, if you like, looking towards the kingdom of heaven. And, and of course, very importantly, we have the third and, in fact, the final prediction of the passion from Jesus. And it's that that I'm going to focus on in, in, in our uh, top theme sec section. So um, I've actually held off talking about the passion predictions. They obviously started in chapter eight and we had them last, uh, last week in chapter nine, but I've waited until this time to talk about them as a complete set. So I, I think the first thing is just to look at what they all have in common. Well, they all have a common context, which is about being on a journey in this on the way section, but also specifically that there is the, the journey is actually caught, Mark calls attention to it before the passion prediction happens in each case. Each of them are directed to the disciples or the 12, not necessarily the 12 in all cases. And their subject is always what the son of man, what's gonna to happen to the son of man. So just looking at those briefly, um, in chapter eight, we saw that on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? And then we have that whole thing with Peter and you are the Christ. And then Jesus immediately goes on to say, he began to teach them that the son of man must undergo great suffering. So the red here is about the context. The blue is about the audience, the disciples, and the, the green is the son of man. So looking at that in chapter nine, which we looked on last week, they went on from where they were and they passed through Galilee. They're heading southwards last week in chapter nine. And he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the son of man is to be betrayed. So that's what happened last week. And now taking it on in this week, we've got the fact that they were on the way, it says here in chapter 10, but he took the 12 aside this time and said, the son of man will be handed over. So very, very similar context, similar audience, and absolutely identical with regard to them all being about what's gonna to happen to the son of man. They also have a, similar, a similarity that in each case, close to the passion prediction, Jesus has to correct uh, an inappropriate action or statement by the disciples. So usually it follows immediately afterwards, which is makes it even more hard to understand. So immediately after saying that this is what's going to happen to the Son of Man in chapter 8, Peter says, well, that's not going to happen, Jesus. You've got it all wrong there. In chapter 9, Jesus says about the Son of Man being betrayed, and then they have an argument about who's the greatest. And even further on from that, John says, oh, well, we, we stopped somebody casting out demons who they weren't one of us. Um, really not getting it. And then this time in chapter 10, this week, we've got Jesus talking about what's going to happen to him. And then James thinks this is the, James and John think this is their great time to get in their request for a power graph. All completely missing what this is about. And therefore, Jesus feels the need to give them instruction on what true discipleship is. And all of these are in a very similar form. If you want to, if anybody wants to, then they must do this. So if anybody wants to follow me, be my disciple. Anybody who wants to be first must be servant of all. And the same thing this week 
Anybody who wished to be first amongst you must be slave of all. Servant and slave are pretty much synonymous. Two different Greek words, but uh, one is diakonos and one is doulos, but they basically have the same meaning here. So that's what the passion predictions have in common. Let's have a look at how they differ a little bit. So let's look at them in a little bit more detail, see how they're built up. So the first one, it says, the son of man must suffer and be rejected by elders, chief priests and scribes, and then be killed. And after three days rise again. So this is, if you like, what you might call the bare bones version of the passion prediction. You know, there's the suffering and rejection, but no detail about it. Killed, rise again. Then we have the second one last week in chapter nine, this time slightly different element, not about rejected, not, no, no detail about who, handed over into human hands and then kill and rise again. So similarly bare bones, but it was slightly different emphasis on the top. The third one, which is this week's passion prediction is much fuller. So handed over to the chief priests and scribes and elders, they will condemn him to death they will actually hand him over to the Gentiles, which is the, uh, um, and then they will mock, spit, and flog him before they will kill him. And after three days, he will rise again. So it's interesting. You can see this is a fuller version, got a lot more detail. But look at this common element killed, rise again, killed, rise again, killed, rise again. Betrayal handed over. It's lots of common elements with this slightly more detailed version in number three. And so looking at number three in a bit more detail, we can sort of break this down and see how this is actually fulfilled when we go further on into the passion, uh, into the passion narratives. So I'm not expecting you to take in all the detail of this, but you can have a look at this presentation afterwards and, and look and you can start doing the comparisons. So it says he'll be handed over. And indeed he was handed over to the chief priests, the scribes, they were all there. They condemned him to death. They did indeed. All of them condemned him as deserving death. And then they handed him over to the Gentiles, which in this case was Pilate. So they bound him, levered him away, sent it to Pilate. That was by the start of chapter 15. And then the Gentiles, or the soldiers in this case, mock, spit upon and flog him. So there's the detail of that in one scene. And then there's another scene with the purple cloak and the mocking him as king of the Jews. So all of this... The prediction exactly what happens in the passion he will be killed of course they crucified him and jesus breathed his last last midway through chapter 15 and then of course it wasn't the end early on the first day of the week they met the young man at the tomb he has been raised he is not here so that's just the way in which the detailed passion prediction maps out into what actually happens in the passion narratives and in the resurrection so We've got some similarity, some difference, but all really heading towards the same point. And another key thing that is expressed across them all is this idea that God is behind this plan. So in chapter eight, we talked about the son of man must. And that, remember that little word we, we focused on day? Uh, it is necessary that he must suffer many things. So that's a divine necessity. And in chapters nine and 10, we see things expressed in the passive voice to be handed over. So diff two different versions of that verb, um, but it's the same same verb basically, is to be handed over, will be handed over. That passive is what we call a divine passive. God is actually making all of this happen, but God's not doing the doing, he's having human actors play their parts. It's the chief priests and scribes and elders who hand him over to the Gentiles who then cause Jesus to die. And all of this, of course, is fulfilling the scriptures and particularly and this is something i want you to kind of perhaps in your own time perhaps look in a bit more detail the servant songs in um the later chapters of the prophets isaiah particularly in this case chapters 50 and 53 and i'm just not going to kind of go through these quotations in detail but just to show you how these um these parts of these scriptures um actually were fulfilled in jesus's passion and of course there's no secret to that because these, this is the reading that is on Good Friday from the prophet Isaiah, the first reading at our solemn liturgy. And you can probably recognize some of the phrases there. And so I've just given you some of them just to illustrate how many of these aspects were then fulfilled in Jesus. And one other element is Psalm 22, um, which is also 
is the responsorial psalm on Good Friday. The compilers of the lecture who knew what they were doing, you see. All who see me mock me, they curl their lips, they toss their heads. He trusted in God, let him save him if this is his friend. So there you go, get it anyway. So you can see that this is all part of that divine plan as expressed in the scriptures. So that's the passion predictions. Let's go on to um, style matters. Um, I'm going to actually I'm prompted a little bit by one of the questions that was asked last week that I didn't properly answer, but I sent a little message about. It set me thinking about verbs, basically. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of stuff about how Mark uses verbs in chapter 10, um, just to give you a feel for, because some of these things don't always come across in English translation. So without trying to give you too much of a grammar lesson, the imperfect tense of the verb in Greek tends to express continuous action in the past. And a great example of that is Bartimaeus, because many were rebuking him. Epetimon, which is a pit of mao, which is that verb to rebuke, like rebuking demons, that's actually in the imperfect tense. So they were carrying on rebuking him, telling him to shut up, but he kept on <laughs> calling out even the more, it says. Ekrazen. So both of those verbs are in the imperfect. So implying, a, say, an ongoing, continuous action. But the imperfect can also express a sort of habitual action or an ongoing action that's not continuous, but is kind of regular, if you like. And so Jesus, in fact, early in the chapter, um, began to teach, it said, was his custom to do so. And that's exactly what he did. So that's the very first verse of chapter 10. Let's have a look at two of the other tenses. So the aorist, which we don't really have in English. Um, but the aorist in Greek is a sort of perfective tense. In other words, it expresses something, um, amongst other things, it expresses something that's kind of done, if you like, as a single action. It's not about past. It's about an action viewed as a whole, if you like, as a complete, completed thing. Then the perfect tense is rather more like we have it in English. Um, so um, a past action. But in often in Greek, it's not used as the main past tense, aorist is, tends to be used as the, as the main past tense. The perfect is often used when the action happens in the past, but there is something about its consequences or its effects that are sort of continue into the present. And so as an example of both of those, Peter's statement that we, we left everything and followed you, actually I'm translating it quite literally here, and sadly none of the English translations do this. So Ephekamen is an aorist. Um, and so that is basically, we left, we did it. We left everything, we did that, and it's done. And it's, if you like, we can look at that action as a single completed action. And we have followed you, which they're continuing to do in a sense, but it's not imperfect. The following is continuing to have consequences, not least of which is they're completely poor, for example. So there's the dip, there's the aorist and there's the perfect put together. Sadly, you'll never see an English translation that renders that. I don't quite know why, because it's not that, it's not that difficult. I, I mean, it's not the most idiomatic English there, but we left everything and we have followed you, is really the essence of what that statement is trying to make. And then there's a couple of imperatives. So um, if you get a present imperative, a command, that's do it now. Okay. And then if it's an aorist imperative, it tends to be about, again, this single decisive action. Let's see an example of that wonderful one in what Jesus says to the rich, rich man. So here the colors are, the red is the, is the present imperative. So go hupage and follow akolothei. So go and follow me. And then sell and give or make the decisive action and do it. Do it and have it done. Or less on what you own and give those the money to the poor. And then the green one, it happens to be a future tense, you will have. But anyway, so you get an idea of just the way the different tenses of the verbs work. So just take, taking that further into the present, there's a rather nice example of the present in, in this chapter of Mark, having the force of a command. And it's this wonderful phrase um, when, when Jesus says, you know, the so-called rulers lord it over people. Not so is it to be among you, or various ways of saying it. Literally in the Greek, um, this is but death, not uh, hutos so. So, but not so is it with you or among you. So that's literally what it, what it says. And there are different translation approaches. It's fascinating to look at it. So the NRSV, Catholic edition, which is the one I tend to use, um, just mainly for convenience, 
um, goes for a relatively little version, but it is not so among you. That's a pretty literal um, and idiomatic English translation. Nick King leave, loses the but in order to focus on the not, which I think he's right. The, the uh here, uh, that basically, that's the negative negation there. Um, that's ba basically what he's going on. So not so is it among you. Um, others say, try to use the future. It shall not be, or a kind of um, form of the subjunctive maybe, but it shall not be so among you, or a, a, a you know, form of the imperative. So there the King James and the ESV kind of try and take, well, what's this really trying to say? So it's not so literal, but they're really trying to get across the meaning. Fascinating you're seeing the different translation approaches here. Here's one I really like. It's not literal, but I think it does a really good job of expressing the terseness. So those of you who've got the new international version, not so with you. So they leave out but and they leave out is in order to try and convey the terseness of the statement. But anyway, a very interesting example, both of the use of the present in that way and of the different translation approaches. By the way, Matthew and Luke obviously kind of, you know, not struggled, but they kind of had a go with this stuff themselves. And their Greek is slightly different than Mark's. Um, Matthew says, not so will it be with you. So he's gone for an estai, which is a future tense. So he's, he's gone away from the present altogether in order to really express that idea. It's not going to be like that with you. Luke drops the verb in order to get that NIV-like terseness. Literally, but you, not so. Um, so an absolutely wonderful um, way, way in which Luke, Luke gets it. But say, different ways of expressing the same thing. Another aspect of the present, which we touched, touched on a few weeks ago, was the historic presence. This is where we use the present tense, Mark uses the present tense, um, in order to express a past event. It's very Markan. Um, he mostly does it with verbs of speech, so either to say or to call or to answer. So we see it here, for example, the blue bits are where, it, this is in the English, it seems to be a past verb, but actually in the Greek, that's a present tense. Then Jesus looked around and says, to his disciples, literally in the Greek, and Jesus says to them again, and Jesus says. So that's a very Markan way of doing things. Again, you don't always see it in English translation, because to be frank, if any translator did it all the time, it would drive you nuts. Um, so, and that's why no translation would be absolutely literal, as I said the other week. The other way in which the historic present is often used is in verbs of movement. So go, come, and gather, for example, in this chapter, and um, so he left that place and goes to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan and crowds gather behind him. So just to kind of give you a feel for it, these um, these little markings, by the way, are what my software does to help me recognize um, a historic presence um, if I haven't noticed it in the Greek. So that's it's just a little help the software gives me. Anyway, finally on verbs, the voice, which is passive or active. So the sometimes in the passive. I said before, it's really a divine passive. And we talked about these two passion uh, passion predictions. The Son of Man is to be handed over using this paradidomi verb. And it say in both cases, the, the agent is not stated, the subject of the verb is not stated, but actually it's implied that it's really God controlling all this. And that contrasts with the fact that actually the second half of the prediction then is always he will be killed by somebody. They will kill him. So that's the um, the human hands will kill him or they will condemn him to death. That's the chief priests and scribes and the elders. And they'll hand him over to the Gentiles and they, the Gentiles, will mock him and do this thing. So passive for God, active for the human agents who are doing the the, the will of God, if you like, in trying to bring this uh, to, 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 to fruition. Curiously, and I think it is only a curiosity, I wouldn't make too much of this, um, in all the Passion Predictions, Mark says Jesus will rise again, which is in the active voice, whereas in mostly in Matthew, Luke and John, it's mostly he is raised. There's actually a couple of exceptions, which is why I wouldn't make too big a deal of it. And finally, just on the style element, there's a very Markan thing, which again, you probably wouldn't even notice because this is also a construction that is possible in English, which is the use of the verb to begin, which happens to be archestai in, in, in Greek, uh, begin plus the infinitive, so to begin to do something. And um, so the way we see that often, um, you know, in this kind of began to um, give you an example here, Peter began to say to literally, exato is from this verb archestai, 
Legain is to say, it's the infinitive of the verb to say. Began to, Peter began to say to him. And then later on, they began to be angry with James and John. They began to be angry around James and John, if you like. So just a curiosity of Mark, he uses it 26 times, um, which was obviously too much for Matthew and Luke, who rather kind of frowned on that, probably thought it was a bit common or something like that. Um, and so they don't do so much of it. Again, I'm just trying to give you a kind of feel for the, for the Greek elements that are underneath some of the English translations. You don't always see all of this stuff, um, but just to give you a feel that there is a distinctive element to the style, which we talked about way back in, in, in session one. Let's talk about words. Um, so this word this week, I thought that the, really the word we had to go for is lutron. Lutron is a word for ransom or recompense. Um, so that comes from that wonderful phrase, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom, a lutron for many. Now that's a word in Greek that has a secular context. It's a, an economic or mercantile term. Um, you could pay a sum to free a slave or freeing prisoners in a war, you know, that sort of ransom or, or to kind of buy back some land or, or other possessions that may have had to be uh, kind of given up for some reason, perhaps because somebody had got into poverty. In the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Hebrew scriptures, we see it used in a variety of ways. So that kind of secular sense of buying back property, we see in Leviticus, um, but we also see an interesting use of it in Leviticus to redeem a kinsman who's got into bondage to a, a foreigner, a resident alien, as our American friends might have it. So um, Leviticus actually deals with that situation. And in the book of Exodus, um, God talks about um, when, when the uh, people of Israel are about to be freed um, with the Passover. God talks about offering sacrifices in place of the firstborn. He usually talks about it um, happening with um, animals, but it also that the, the, the people of Israel could offer sacrifice in place of the firstborn sons as well. So um, both of these elements uh, that are that these types of redemptions or ransoms both explicitly say that it's about reminding them that the Lord redeemed them out of Egypt. So there's that when you ever hear this word ransom, you've got to think that Exodus context for the reader of the original gospel. Very much aware that it's God who ransomed. But also during the Maccabean period, which was the hundred years, um, you know, or, or so just before Jesus was on earth, the ransom language tends to be used for martyrdom. And so, for example, that amazing reading from the second book of Maccabees that we do get about the seven sons. There's a whole lot of language in that reading about having a sacrificial death that atones for the sins of the people. So, in other words, having a death that in some way recompenses for people's sins. Obviously, a big suggestion there of what's happening with Jesus as well. Now, where this, though, particularly is expressed in the Old Testament, once again is in the prophet Isaiah. And in these later chapters, um, in second and third Isaiah, as we call it, um, these later chapters of the, of the prophet Isaiah, and they're all really about the Lord redeeming Israel. Remember the context here for the original audience of Isaiah was about Israel um, being kind of scattered, if you like, and facing exile and the Lord bringing them back. And so I'm not going to go through all these quotations in turn, but one or two of them will be quite familiar. For example, that one, do not be afraid for I have redeemed you. And um, most of you will know the song that goes with that. Um, the Lord always is the one who redeems. So this is what the Lord who redeems you says. And by the way, this wonderful scroll on the right is from the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is the great Isaiah scroll, as it's called. And so all these are in Isaiah, you will be redeemed, but not with money. And uh, you will be a holy people ransomed by the Lord. Look at this language. Does it not make you think of some of these wonderful images of an Easter people ransomed as well and redeemed? So there you are. So there's just a, a few quotations of Isaiah. My point here is that the ransom language, mostly using Lutron, but not always, the ransom language is absolutely right through these later chapters of the prophet Isaiah. And of course, that would be in what is in Jesus's mind and also in Mark's audience's mind when we hear Jesus being a ransom for many. 
And um, let's um, see, in fact, for all that, the actual word ransom, Lutron, is actually only happens once in Mark, and it only happens once in Matthew, as it happens. Luke uses it only a few times as well. And most of the time, he's expressing ideas that are based on Old Testament language. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has visited his people and redeemed them. That's the verb that comes from Lutron. So that's the Benedictus there. So they're all trying to get that kind of, if you like, that Isaiah that prophetic heritage of God's redemption. It's only when we actually come to the New Testament letters that we see a thoroughgoing use of Lutron and ransom-like language to express the redemptive um, aspect of Jesus' death. So we see it eight times, a similar word here, apolalutrosis, used by the Apostle Paul and also in the letter to the Hebrews, and also some other forms um, scattered around um, Titus and Timothy and Hebrews and a little bit in 1 Peter as well. So it's just an interesting way in which that word kind of begins to develop in Mark and, and in the other things, but it's really more of a kind of Pauline kind of expression of, 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 of and concept. Uh, there is another aspect, though, that I think I really did want to draw your attention to, which is, remember it's said in, in, the, in, in, the, uh, in that quotation, Son of Man came not to be served, but to uh, serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, that can put some people off thinking, well, is it only, it's not for everybody then. But that's really not thinking in the way that the, as the, the, the Semitic way in which that, that word would have been expressed. In Semitic thought, many is not an exclusive. It's not a not all. It's a contrast to the one who is giving his life. So here he gives his life. One gives his life as a ransom, as a lutron for many, or anti polon for the many, that is. So the contrast is between the many who are redeemed and the one whose action makes the redemption happen. And that again, once again, we see this in Isaiah. So again, I'll let you look at these in detail, but you can see that even the Greek is the same here. There's the righteous one who serves many. And because of this, he'll cause many to inherit and he bore the sins of many. All from this part of the uh, part of the prophet Isaiah that we read on Good Friday. And of course, we hear antipolon in the Greek for many in the institution of the Eucharist in Mark. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Now, I'm not going to get into the missile translation wars unless somebody wants to ask me a question about it. But the key point here is that the many, which is rendered in the Latin, and that's why which, you know, it's now being translated literally. When we hear many in this Semitic context, we need to think not of a, necessarily of a restricted set, but of the one being sacrificed for the benefit of the many. So the contrast is with the one, not with the all. So that's really very important. So hupapolon is the Greek there in, the, in those words in Mark. And as I say, they're carried through into the Latin of the mass. Okay, let's have a look at some other topics then. So um, we talked a lot about on the way, this is the section on the way. And of course, there's a geographical sense in which the way is happening. We're all heading to Jerusalem, aren't we? Um, so they're on the way to Jerusalem, it says. And of course, there's reminders constantly here that we're on the way. As he was setting out on the way, it says something happened. And by the way, it says in the both in, in the uh, Bartimaeus story and on the way, ente hodo. So all of these same Greek verbs. Jesus's actual geographical route is a little bit uncertain here. Remember, Mark doesn't really worry about it very much. So we don't know exactly where he went, which is why that line is a bit dotted between Capernaum, where we knew where he was, and Jericho, where we knew where he is at the end of this, and Jerusalem, where he'll definitely be next chapter in chapter 11. Does it really matter that much? He seems to be hugging the Jordan. That's the, that's the impression that the gospel gives you, but it doesn't really matter one way or the other. The more important element compared to the geography is the way being a metaphor for discipleship. So he will prepare your way going right back to chapter one, the, the, the John the Baptist uh, uh, um, prophecy. Remember chapter four? Things sown on the path. Well, that's ten hot on. It's same word in Greek. Path in English translation, but it's the way, really. Nothing for their journey, it says, when the twelve are sent out. They mustn't take anything for their journey. Same Greek word. All the resonances here, the kind of building up. 
and there will be another one in chapter 12 when the scribe says well you you know the, the, the um Sadducees, sorry say well you know the ways of god so what's what's the right thing to say here so constant kind of hinting at a way being a way of discipleship and of course this is actually um this is quite consistent with the way that the word hodon um, is used in the hebrew scriptures and particularly in the greek translation so again i've given you a whole load of references there to the way of the lord i can i could have given you just as many for the ways of the lord um but you have a look at some of those so you can see how it works and you might remember this little bit of isaiah 42 i will lead the blind in a way they do not know remember the on the way section started with the blind man at bethsaida ends with the blind man at jericho so very interesting little quotation there in relation to the way and we see jesus plowing ahead on the way he goes ahead doesn't he he was walking ahead of them pro agon remember pro, like proactive basically that's where eventually that word comes from in english it's from from the greek root there so lots of lots of metaphors if you like of being on the way let's talk about divorce so i couldn't duck this one I'm mostly going to talk about the Marken aspects of this issue, um, but uh, you know I will talk a little bit about its um, its application um, towards the end. So, first of all, as you rightly identified, this is really a test by the Pharisees, um, and it actually says that, doesn't it, to test him? They asked, and it's not the first time the Pharisees have tested him. They did it in chapter eight, and it won't be the last time they do it. They're going to do it again in chapter twelve. Pharisees knew the answer to the question because it said so in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter twenty-four which largely talks about what uh, largely talks about the fact that if somebody has divorced a wife they can't take it back again that's the in essence what it is but you have this little quotation basically if the wife finds no favor because he the husband has found something objectionable in her most of the debate from the pharisees was about that phrase it could have been a trap as you say because herodias was a good example of somebody who was divorced and remarried as was herod antipas himself and the practice, though, of divorce, not only was the law well established, but the practice was pretty much well established. It was not uncommon. Um, and most debate amongst rabbis and scholars was actually about what this something objectionable meant. In other words, what are the grounds of a divorce, not whether it's allowed at all or not. Many of you pointed out, sadly, this is one aspect in which the um, really hugely male dominated element of society came out so husbands could divorce wives but wives could not divorce husbands and adultery was an offense committed against another man not against a woman woman didn't matter sadly and that's the way they saw it the pharisaic rules that were on top of the law offered some protection to the divorce wives so in other words taking divorce for granted they then tried to mitigate the negative impact on the divorce wife because they were completely um, um, in, you know, in a state where they um, needed protection. They were in a very vulnerable state. So there were rules about the ability to remarry by getting this certificate that they talk about in Deuteronomy chapter 24, and also about protecting the property. But it's all very contract oriented. Can you see? This is not about what Jesus really wants to talk about. So let's get on to that. Because when Jesus asks them, they ask, they ask Jesus a question, and Jesus, in good rabbinic fashion, puts a question back to them well what did moses command you the verb is very interesting what did he command you see moses didn't command them to divorce and even the pharisees have to admit that they have to admit that moses only permitted it they permitted a man to write a little document and divorce her send her away literally the actual command that moses said he did command something that's in the book of Genesis. Because remember, they thought Moses wrote all five books. The two shall become one flesh. That's what Moses commanded is really, in essence, what Jesus is saying. So he's not just bringing them back to basics. He's actually saying that was the will of God that Moses was expressing for you. And so Jesus' teaching is much more radical. Divorce was only allowed because of the hardness of heart of the people. It's an accommodation. But the reality is the reality as stated in Genesis, that the two are not no longer two, but one flesh. And therefore, if God has joined two together to become one, no man, and we're talking about the man 
There's no no courts here doing this. Remember, this is the man who sends some sends the wife away. So no husband can separate. In other words, Jesus is effectively making divorce inapplicable. Because he then goes on to say, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her and the other way around. But here commits adultery against her. So Jesus is not just talking about the mutuality of marriage. He's talking about equality in terms of the treatment of women compared to the patriarchal way in which they were treated in that society. So there's a much um, broader view that Jesus has taken. And of course, we've seen Jesus do this before, haven't we? We've seen Jesus look at what the mere law is and say, well, there's something beyond the law that you are missing. So with fasting, we can do more. With Sabbath observance, it's not about, you know, imposing laws on men. It's about men being enabled to glorify God through the Sabbath, about unclean foods. Don't go with the mere human tradition. Go back to the commandments of God. So go beyond merely just following the letter to fulfilling God's will. Does that remind you of the rich man as well? Look at the consistency from the start of this chapter to the middle of it. These common topics, the big picture here. Now, I can't duck the issue that divorce, all of us will know. Some of us will have been, you know, divorced or whatever. Some of us will have, you know, had family members or dear friends. There's hardly anybody who does not have something some experience of this issue. So this isn't really, obviously, as this is a session about Mark's gospel, but I couldn't duck, well, what does this mean to us? Well, I think we just need, again, I'm really stating here what the church teaches and what the scripture says. The teaching of the church has not changed because Jesus' teaching is fairly, you know, is fairly unequivocal, but the application of that teaching needs to continually progress and i think that's what pope francis is really challenging us to because i think the pastoral care of all people affected by divorce has never been enough we've never really shown enough love and enough care to all the people who are um, affected by those issues and i do really commend you to read a bit of non-scripture for a second, for, for a short while. If you want to, you know, look into this issue and see the way the Pope is teaching, Amoris Laetitia is a wonderful document and it's an immensely pastoral document. Read these small paragraphs of Amoris Laetitia. You can get it on the web. You don't have to buy the book. You can find it on the web. It is worth looking at. And all, so for example, I'm just gonna take two quotations. It is important the Pope says, that the divorce who have entered a new union should be made to feel part of the church. They are not excommunicated, it says. And that's a really very important phrase. And then it talks about this need to accompany people who are divorced and remarried. The law is the law, but the application of the law has to happen on an individual accompaniment basis. So they're really very important teachings not for us just to set aside and sit in pharisaical fashion on the law as if we were comfortable with that alone. Likewise, Pope John Paul, see, people don't realize what a wonderful pastoral um, letter, for example, Familiaris, Familiaris Consortio is. It talks, it wasn't just with, Pope, it wasn't invented with Pope Francis. Pope John Paul talked about careful discernment of individual situations and acknowledged, for example, that there are those who through no fault of their own have been abandoned by their legitimate partner, as well as many other situations. All divorces are tragic and all are individual. And that's really what the Pope was uh, causing us to kind of look at with regard to that. Now, I don't have time, nor is it the right place to talk in any more detail about what is a very sensitive and difficult issue. But I did want to make it clear that the church's teaching does not just sit comfortably with the law and just say, that's it, get on with it. I think we are all in love, required to do much more to help all our friends, not just the divorce, but, but certainly in this particular application, that's what we're talking about. So do take a look at those two wonderful letters, just those small paragraphs, you'll, you'll certainly benefit from. It. So let's have a look quickly at the riches and the kingdom of God. I think we talked about this a little bit before, but uh, in, in our groups, but 
the rich man, it's really about what he, what, well, he wants to know what he can do. He thinks it's all about doing to inherit eternal life. But actually the children, the lesson of the children is that entering the kingdom is a gift from God. You see, it's not about the, not even really about innocence. It's certainly not about any sentimental view of children. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God, it's about the reception of the kingdom. If you receive it as a child, you receive it as gift. And that's the way we all have to do it because none of us, we are all beggars in the sight of God, said one of the saints. Jesus then, of course, gets him to look at the commandments. Interestingly, all of the ones that concern relationships with others. But what he ultimately calls people to, just in the teaching on divorce, is a radical view of the law. Um, to give up property. And in fact, that wasn't unknown. The Essenes of the Dead Sea Scrolls community, they relinquish property. And if you have a look at the story of Elisha, you'll see that he um, gave up his property in order to go and follow Elijah. But the man is quite shocked by it because he assumed that keeping the commandments was enough. And he had Deuteronomy chapter 30 to go with. If you obey the commandments, you shall live. Oh, there you are. I'm doing it. And the disciples were thinking, well, how can he send the rich guy away? Isn't the rich guy the good guy? Isn't that what we learn in the book of Deuteronomy? And didn't we learn it in Job? The Lord will make you abound in prosperity if you, fo if you follow the law. So what's this happening with the rich man? He's following the law. Isn't that good enough? Jesus is looking for a lot more. Why? Because the problem with riches is that they get in the way of the relationship with Jesus. And the context for this challenge that Jesus sets is Jesus looking at him, loved him. It's a, it's a challenge of love. And then it's a challenge to follow Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's not, a, and therefore it's an individual call. And if it's following Jesus, it's taking on his mission. For my sake and the sake of the good news, it says. It's not about, I mean, skepticism is a worthy Christian tradition and can be a very um, rich way of following the gospel for certain individuals but this in the scripture here in mark it's not really about asceticism for its own sake it's about lightening your load so you can be on the way with jesus remember that chapter six with the 12 he ordered them to take nothing for their journey remember that's the hod on the way and this is really where the rich man contrasts with the child the rich man's got everything but he can't give it up the child and bartimaeus have nothing and therefore they can accept everything as a pure gift from God and even the disciples bless them despite all their other failings at least they have given up everything to follow Jesus it's a back to Jesus it's all about Jesus and so that really is about what Jesus says elsewhere in Mark this is not a new teaching remember in the parable of the seeds the law of wealth chokes the word and it yields, ends up yielding nothing. And what would it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose their life? Oh, by the way, I just thought I'd take this one on. Um, many of you will have heard that the eye of the needle is a gate in Jerusalem. That's a load of rubbish. Um, that's, uh, there is absolutely no evidence for that whatsoever. Um, um, it does give rise to some beautiful little uh, children's stories, um, which have some merit in them. Um, but just so you know, um, it, it it is pure exaggeration, this. The, 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 the camel wasn't getting through a slightly difficult gate and had to get rid of its baggage. That's not really what this is about, although that's an interesting, you know, an interesting metaphor in its own right, but not for this, not for this statement of Jesus. This is another bit of his old Semitic hyperbole that we had last week. And yet, it's not entirely exaggerated because it's impossible, literally, it's as impossible as getting the camel through an eye of a needle for a person to earn their own salvation. It's all got to be about God. For men, it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. And that has a wonderful Old Testament heritage of its own. And I'll just put these on screen and you can have a look at them in your own time. Nothing is impossible to God. And you will also know the wonderful statement in chapter one of Luke, for nothing shall be impossible to God, the angel tells Mary. And of course, we did see that there are some compensations for following Jesus, but it's certainly not a get rich quick scheme. Um, there is nobody who will not receive the hundredfold in this age, which is a bit like the ones sown on the good soil who bear four fruit a hundredfold. You see the way that phrase is recalled. 
new family and homes and possessions. But this time it will be not just your single family, but the family all over the world of which we're a part, my friends, who follow God's will. Because whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. And wherever they go, they will receive them gladly as the 12 were promised. Whenever you enter a house, you'll be welcome there, hopefully. And I won't read this in detail, but St. John Cassian had a wonderful phrase which basically said, you've left one family and father and mother and home, but you've gained countless fathers, mothers and brothers, because wherever you go in the world, they will receive you as the one family of God. OK, that sounds good. But Jesus has always got a sting in the tail, but not without persecution. Just to put that in at the end there, just to remind you that the cross is always there. And by the way, just to kind of let you know, this whole see, uh, whole episode has a nice little chiasm about it. thought we wouldn't go a couple of weeks without having a chiasm. So we started with a question about eternal life. Um, the rich man then finds he can't actually keep hold of his possessions and still follow Jesus. Jesus then, at the center of this, explains how hard it is to enter the kingdom. The disciples are amazed and they're so amazed Jesus has to go around it twice. So we actually get a double center of the chiasm here. And then we get the fact that Peter says, well, we've left possessions. We're not like the rich man. We've left possessions and we followed you. And Jesus says, yes, that's right. And there'll be a hundredfold for you, not just in the present life, but also in the eternal life, which neatly mirrors the other end of the chiasm there as well. So these little structures are playing in Mark to help underpin the way the themes are developed. Let's have a quick look at James and John. There are boys with sharp elbows that sons of uh, the sons of thunder, aren't they? They're not just content to about arguing about who the greatest is. They want the prime slots in the kingdom of heaven. They're rather devious about it, don't they? They say, teacher, can you promise, basically, can you give us a blank check? Whatever we ask of you, we want you to promise. Jesus says, well, what is it you want then? I, want to, I reminded our group that actually their dad, Zebedee, could afford hired men back in chapter one. So he must have had a little bit of, uh, li little bit of money about him. And so maybe here we've got people who are used to having things and used to having their own way. Um, Matthew is so embarrassed about all this, by the way, he blames the whole thing on their poor mother. Um, like a good Jewish mother, she wants her boys in the best place. And so she asks Jesus instead. Perhaps they actually think, well, we're getting to Jerusalem now. Maybe Jesus is ascending the throne. This is the right time to make our request. But Jesus's question to them is very simple. What do you want me to do for you? which is exactly the same question in exactly the same Greek as he asks Bartimaeus. But Bartimaeus's question is far more innocent, far more disciple-like. Different demands, different attitudes. Very sad, isn't it? And the other disciples, of course, are furious with them, but perhaps not because they thought it was wrong, just because they thought they'd stolen a march on them, maybe. You see, there's a wonderful irony about the whole thing here. Seats of right and left, well, you know, they wanted places of honor. That's something Jesus criticized the scribes for. We'll see in chapter 12 when we come to it. Um, and it could have been about power. And I've given you some references there to um, Psalm 110. But the big irony here is that Jesus's glory is on the cross. And he has got people on his right and left. But they're criminals and they're facing suffering with him. So that's what the cup and the baptism about. Don't have time to go through this in detail. But there's a load of Old Testament references, and I've just given you a few here. Take a look at the notes pages of the PowerPoint file. I've given you a much longer list of references, really very rich image. And of course, the cup will appear again in Gethsemane, won't it? And baptism is really about being drowned, about being overwhelmed. And if you want to have a look at my um, Bible words, baptizo, again, if you get the PowerPoint, you can click on this link and you can go through to the podcast so that you can hear more about that. Now, James and John say they can drink the cup, but they don't. Not when the crisis happens. They deserted him just like everybody else and fled. Although James, to be fair, did eventually face martyrdom in Acts of the Apostles. So there's a sort of double irony there, maybe. This is really, you see, leads Jesus to talk about servant leadership. He calls the 12 together like he does at any at several important places uh, in his ministry and tells them not just that he will suffer and die, but why he's going to suffer and die to give his life as a ransom for many. And that recalls the paradoxes that we see elsewhere in Mark. You've got to lose your life to save it. If you're going to be first, you've got to be last. And again, the background of Isaiah and the suffering servant is right behind all of this. And again, don't have time to kind of go through these, 
But what I'm trying to illustrate here is even the Greek words are the same as this Mark 10, 45. So there's a lot of kind of very close parallel happening there. Interestingly, though, there's not a lot of evidence that most Jews of the time actually applied the suffering servant to the Messiah. They didn't see them as the same figure. And that's why they sort of miss really what Jesus is doing. Jesus is really kind of doing that in a new way. This is all in contradiction to the world's values. In our parish, you may have seen a diagram like this one here over on the right that Father Mark shows. The idea is that those of us who serve Jesus must be prepared to be servants like him. And let's finish with Bartimaeus. Remember, it was part of the bookends of this on the way section. We started with the guy in Bethsaida in the middle of chapter eight. We're finishing here at the end of chapter 10 with Bartimaeus. Few special mark and details here. Um, his name, the fact that he gets encouraged, but most significantly that he throws off his cloak, which presumably would have been the thing that had held all his money with his begging proceeds. He wouldn't have needed a second cloak in Jericho. It's pretty warm down there. And he springs up. All those lovely mark and details, but they're quite significant. They're not just kind of a bit of fun narrative color. There's a lot of meaning behind them. Bartimaeus, you see, is one of those little ones, isn't he? They don't, the disciples don't think he's one of us, but Jesus does. And it's like a child, if you like, that's given attention, even though they don't think he should be. And Jesus even stands still so the blind man can come to him. Perhaps where Jesus had last spoken. So again, very attentive to the blind man's need. And so it's a parabolic summary, I think, this whole story of the whole on the way section. It's about Jesus's identity and it's about what discipleship means. And in that respect, Bartimaeus is a model disciple. He knows he needs Jesus's help. He asks, have mercy on me more than once and asks, let me see again. His faith is persistent. Remember, we talked about this imperfect. He kept calling out and Jesus calls attention to his faith. He has an insight that nobody else has into Jesus's identity, calling him son of David. He responds immediately and enthusiastically and with vigor to Jesus's call. And he addresses Jesus in relationship. This Rabuni is my teacher, not just rabbi, but Rabuni, my teacher, a relationship with Jesus. And he gives up what he has, what little he has to follow in Jesus, not his, just his cloak, but presumably the earnings that he had that day from his begging. And that recalls the not putting on two tunics that the 12 were told. And he follows Jesus on the way. And I think that's really the message for us all. Let's all follow Jesus on the way. So that's it. I could have had, I could have talked about a whole load of other things, but you can already see that I barely could get through everything here. And I do apologize for running by a few minutes, but that's time to stop. We'll say a prayer and then we'll take some questions. So I think in order to allow people, I do apologize that I've run over by a couple of minutes, which is not what I normally like to do, as you know. But I think what we'll do is we'll say a prayer and those who do need to go, that's fine. Um, but those who want to have questions answered, then we'll go on uh, for 10 minutes or so. So in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God, our Father, we thank and praise you for the gift of your word. We thank you for your son, who is the subject of that word, and the Holy Spirit, who inspires that word. We praise you now as Father, Son, and Spirit, and we ask you to guide us, bless us, and protect us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And so may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace if you want. Um, I hope you don't mind. We won't say goodbye to you. We'll just go straight on with the questions if we may. So, Jared, over to you. Oh, you just need your off mute there, Jared. So you're getting off early this evening Good. because at this point in time, I've only got two questions. So when did the law change so that it became permissible for Jewish women to change to divorce husbands? Uh, so the straight answer to that is I don't know in terms of Jewish law. It's not it's not it's not an area I have any um, expertise on. What I can tell you is that what Mark is probably alluding to 
is the fact that in Roman law, it was already at the time permissible for women to divorce husbands. And those of you who know a little bit about Roman history uh, might know about the rather juicy stories, for example, of uh, um, Messalina, um, Claudius's wife, um, and Agrippina, um, who um, Messalina was certainly uh, hot on the divorce uh, front herself. So um, that's what Mark's talking about. I don't really know about the um, development of Jewish law, nor even whether it's possible today. I, I assume there must be some accommodation to secular law, but I don't really know what it is. I hope that answers the question. Pauline's still here. Have I answered the question or am I way off? Yeah, um, yeah, it is possible. I understand, but I, 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 I've no idea when. No, no idea. Uh, in the world of Mark, we're talking about a world in which it was possible for yeah. Gentile women, or at least women who are operating under Roman law, um, to do so. And it's the, by the way, that's why the kind of Antipas Herodias thing can go on because they're highly Hellenized Jews, not proper Jews at all, right. of course, as far as the Pharisees were concerned. Um, and that's why they kind of did these rather dodgy um, sort of uh, things like, you know, kind of women getting involved in divorces, which certainly wasn't a seemly thing if you were a Pharisee. Okay, thank you. Jared. The other one I've got is um, 13 to 16, <clears throat> where the children are brought for a blessing. Um, and basically what the group was saying, they couldn't think of, and I, I don't really understand what was written. So for question time, if not covered any other instance of children being brought to prophets for blessing, we couldn't think of any seemed something unique with jesus yeah okay i understand the question so yes were children brought to prophets uh, off the top of my head i can't think of an instance um the, the only one i can think of which is not a prophetic one is obviously the children of jacob were brought to him for a blessing and um, that's you know kind of one of the if you like analogous passages there um but but i can't really think of it um uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think the really key thing anyway, so it possibly is more unique to Jesus. I, you get the impression, though, that they were bringing children. It's another one. I think probably the verbs in the imperfect there again, by the way, probably a kind of habitual thing. Maybe wherever Jesus was, you know, you know, there were just people thrusting children. I, I don't really know. Um, what is very clear, though, and I think I alluded to this in the presentation, is that Jesus doesn't think I'm Jesus. Don't you know who I am? I'm far too busy for these non-persons. Jesus takes everybody on. Children, blind beggars, tax collectors, sinners, rich young men. He's even got time for the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus always has time for everybody. And, you know, that is the thing I look upon with a Jesus to my shame. You know, I don't have enough time. I don't have Jesus's time for people. That's where I need to be more like Jesus. Um, you may reflect yourself, but I can only talk about myself. It's one of the ones in which I am so far from the image of my master. Um, that's it. Right, well, um, we can finish early, or does anybody want to put their hand up for a question if they've got something um, they wish to do? Um, you. Claire's going to go, go go for it, Claire. You, you, Martin. You, you um, draw. In, in, in the time of the New Testament, uh, Jewish women seemed to, seemed to have lost status because in the Old Testament, there were there are quite a number of women with authority and status. What, what do you think happened to, to lose these women um, their status? That's that's a very interesting question. I was trying to think. I mean, I think the women who have positions of genuine authority and influence are relative. I mean, they're, they're sufficiently small that you can sort of count them. You can almost enumerate them individually. So I'm thinking of, you know, Sarah, Rebecca, um, Deborah, uh, you know, there, there's um, Judith. There's really not many. Um, many of those. So think of Deborah and Judith. They got authority because Israel was in crisis. So that's one interesting reflection. Um, the other ones were um, the wives of patriarchs, where everything was a bit different. Um, I could be rather cynical and say that once you turn from a simple 
um, basis of religion. You'll always find men who can then complicate it for you. Um, but uh, but I don't really want to get too much into that. I think that there probably is something of that. Um, but I think there was a patriarchal element that was inherent in Jewish society for a very, very, very long time. Um, clearly, we got to a situation where it was pure injustice. And Jesus recognized that. Um, and But, you know, I think... I think the only thing I would also say there is alongside the equality, we have to take the division. The you know, women would be guilty of adultery just as much as men by the standards that Jesus is asking. So it's a sort of equality, but it's a real equality um, in the sight of Jesus's ideal. Um, but clearly a better place to be than the, uh, the patriarchalism of, of, the, of, uh, of the ancient Jewish society. I'm going to assume, unless somebody waves at me desperately, that that's it. Um, and in that case, I'm going to begin to wind down. So, uh, being 9.41, I, I apologize that I took so much of the Q&A time, um, but I'm glad that I didn't deny anybody their question by doing so. 10 was a very difficult chapter for me. I had to leave out whole elements. So I do appeal to you, if you do get time, to go back and have a look at the presentation. Um, we'll ende I'll endeavor to try and get the recording out as early as I can next week um, so that you can take a look at that. It, it, this is a chapter well worth looking at again, I do promise you. 11 is, I hope, a little easier, but we'll see what happens um, if the Lord spares us all to get to that next week. So I think since I've seen nobody waving wildly at me, I will assume that you're happy to go and um, have a good rest. Thank you so much for bearing with me. I do apologize that um, we went on a bit, but as I say, it was, it was really necessary with the amount of stuff that we had to cover this evening. I hope you find the content useful and of interest and God bless you.